Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin with last week's terror attacks and the three-day siege of Mumbai, India's main financial and entertainment capital that has left nearly 200 people dead and hundreds wounded. Indian officials claim that as few as 10 gunmen coordinated attacks that began late Wednesday night on multiple targets, including a crowded railway station, two luxury hotels, a popular cafe, a Jewish center, a hospital, and a movie theater. India's top domestic security official, the Home Minister Shivraj Patil, resigned Sunday over his failure to contain the attacks, which were the latest in a string of attacks and bombings in various Indian cities over the past year. The state chief uh, minister and his deputy have also offered to quit. Prime Minister Mohan Singh appointed the finance minister to fill the nation's top security post. Prime Minister Singh, who oversaw India's economic liberalization in 1991, has now taken over the finance ministry himself. But even as Mumbai and the world mourn all those killed in the attacks, including some two dozen international visitors, criticism about India's security lapses continued to pour in. Some have accused the government of being, quote, soft on terror. Arun Jaitley, a senior member of India's opposition party, known as the Bhartiya Janata Party, or BJP, called on India to allow the model of the United States after, to follow the model of the United States after September 11th, 2001. We must follow the example of what the United States did after 9-11. We are more vulnerable than them, and therefore we must be a tough state and not a soft state. Our intelligence network, our security response, our legal framework all need an overall and all need a strengthening. When all of them see the political establishment is weak on terrorism, each one of them collapses. And that's where the basic change is required. Meanwhile, tensions are rising between India and Pakistan over Pakistan's alleged role in the attacks. A previously unknown Indian group called the Deccan Mujahideen claimed responsibility for the attack. But the only gunman who was captured alive and is being interrogated by Indian security officials is a Pakistani citizen. He has reportedly claimed the attacks were coordinated by the Pakistan-based Lashkar-e-Taiba, a banned Islamist group that has conducted attacks in Indian-administered Kashmir and elsewhere. Indian officials have pointed fingers at Pakistan's role. But Pakistani Foreign uh, Minister Shah Mahmood Karushi, who was visiting India last week, insisted that allegations about Pakistan's involvement are just based on suspicions and not evidence. The Indian leadership has not blamed the government of Pakistan. Please be very clear on that. They are suspecting at this stage, suspecting perhaps groups or organizations that could have presence here to this act. What we have said is, if they have information, if they have evidence, they should share it with us. Any entity or group involved in this ghastly act the government of Pakistan will proceed against it. U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice will be visiting New Delhi on Wednesday in an attempt to defuse tensions between India and Pakistan. Meanwhile, Indian Foreign Secretary uh, Shiv Shankar Maran is in Washington, D.C. today to brief President-elect Obama's transition team about the situation. The U.S. Ambassador to India, David Mulford, pledged U.S. support to India after meeting with Foreign Secretary Menon this weekend. I'd like to express uh, condolences to the people of India from President Bush, President-elect Obama, and from the people of the United States for this uh, terrible terrorist attack which has taken place in Mumbai. We are deeply sympathetic. Our sympathies go to the families of those victims. And, of course, the majority of victims were Indians. But for the first time, we've seen targeting of Westerners, including Americans. Until now, six Americans have been killed. And President Bush has directed us to offer cooperation to the Indian authorities in any way that we can. We will be doing that. The United States is very skilled in this field. We are, as you know, engaged in a global war on terror. 
We're joined right now by a round table of guests in Chicopee, Massachusetts, by Vijay Prashad. He is chair of South Asian History and director of international studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. His latest book is called The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. His article on the Mumbai attacks comes out in Counterpunch today. Veteran Pakistani journalist, commentator, author Tariq Ali joins us on the phone from London. His book is called The Duel, Pakistan and the Flight Path of American Power. His article, The Assault on Mumbai, was published in Counterpunch last week, and we're joined here in our firehouse studio by the New York-based activist Biju Matthew. He's with the Campaign to Stop Funding Hate and the Coalition Against Genocide, a co-founder of the New York Taxi Worker Alliance. His piece appeared in SamarMagazine.org. It's called As the Fires Die. The terror of the aftermath. Let's start with Vijay Prashad. Um, talk about what you understand happened and why this is being called India's 9 11. Uh, good morning, Amy. Uh, it's very unclear uh, why this happened, and I think uh, we would be speculating if we tried to be, uh, you know, completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, without contradictions and without uh, any sort of unease when saying exactly what happened. But uh, why this is called Mumbai's 9/11 is another question. Uh, right when this was occurring. Uh, the uh, relationship between 9-11 and Mumbai uh, began to be made by the media. And, you know, it's become something of a cliché now. Anytime there's any attack, they start to say, this is our 9-11. You know, whether it's the attack in London, uh, whether it's the attack in Indonesia, everybody claims a terrorist attack now as their 9-11. And there's something ominous about this, because it means that the state has to then follow the playbook laid out by the Bush administration right after it uh, experienced, uh, of course, it's 9-11, which is to say that you then go and start a war against an adversary that you claim did the attack, and simultaneously you begin to create a security apparatus inside your state to restrict the civil liberties of all people who live within that country. So 9-11, or branding something as 9-11, has come to have these two aspects. One go to war against somebody without any kind of full police investigation that's decisively uh, shown us who has done the act. So one, a foreign war, and secondly, what you might even consider to be a war against your own population, where you start to restrict civil liberties far in excess of anything necessary, and of course, always fighting the last terrorist attack. So you build up this enormous apparatus of restrictions, which is dealing with the previous attack against your population and not trying to forecast the safety of the population into the near future. And that is why the media started to talk about Mumbai's 9-11. The third reason is that the media had not really called any of the other attacks in Mumbai, and there have been many since 1992, 9-11, precisely because most of those attacks had taken place in areas which afflicted the working poor, the working class, and middle class people. This attack, for the first time, targeted places of the top elite, very expensive hotels, uh, leading restaurants, and this therefore brought this, uh, uh, these kind of assaults into the bedrooms, into the restaurants of the elite, and they uh, found then that this is their 9-11. The other attacks were not called 9-11. They were the kind of normal condition of suffering borne by ordinary people in places like Bombay. So for these three reasons, the media ratcheted up the rhetoric about this being Mumbai's 9-11. And Vijay Prashad, also the criticism of the intelligence services and law enforcement as having failed in this situation, uh, whereas uh, you may not have gotten the kind, that kind of criticism in past uh, terrorist attacks. As you say, there's been a long history uh, of them uh, in India. Well, it's true to some extent that there are two failures that are quite remarkable. One, my sister used to work at the Uberoi in guest relations, the Uberoi at Nariman Point. Now, it's true that the emergency response in a city like Mumbai is abysmal. 
Uh, this was found, of course, by United, by New York after 9-11. The emergency response hadn't been properly considered. You know, how do you go after uh, when there is uh, so many people hurt? Do you have enough ambulatory services? Do you have enough uh, ability to conduct a police operation when people are firing in public areas? So the emergency services have been shown to be quite abysmal, which is why the resignations have occurred. Intelligence, well, look, uh, it was earlier in this year that the intelligence agencies reported to the government of India saying that it is likely that groups are going to come